The old man opened the cellar door and shone his light into the back recesses of the space, past the stacks of old newspapers and magazines, past the broken lamp he never fixed, past the boxes of old bills and the broken window frames that needed new glass. Finally, his light came to rest on an old battered case. Reluctantly, he grabbed the handle, pulling it and years of dust off the shelf. He closed the cellar door and set the case on his workbench. He didn't want to open it. But in a few days, his granddaughter would be getting married and she had made a special request. And who is he to refuse his granddaughter on her wedding day? He clicked open the latches and a dull, beat-up trumpet lay staring lifelessly back at him. The last time he had played it was at his son's funeral. He had died at age 21 on the battlefield, leaving behind a young wife and a six-month-old baby. That day, as he had finished the last mournful notes of taps and pulled the trumpet away from his lips, he vowed he would never breathe life back into that trumpet again. But now that baby girl was getting married and he would not break his promise. The old instrument was in no shape to play anything, let alone Mendelssohn's wedding march. A visit to the repair shop would be the first order of business. It looked like summoning up the courage to actually play would have to wait a few days. The old man opened the door to the repair shop and set the old trumpet on the table before the repairman. He half hoped he would hear that it was not repairable. But instead, he was told, Now, nah, I've seen worse. Give me a few days to bring it back to life. As soon as the door closed, the repairman slowly picked up the instrument. He had seen this model before, but it had been many years ago when he worked as an apprentice at the company that made the trumpet. He knew it had been made to play beautiful music, but neglect, anger, frustration, any number of other things had gotten in the way. It had been abandoned for other pursuits. The repairman began his work. First, he took the trumpet apart and cleaned every piece. Next, he smoothed out all the dents and patched the holes. The trumpet was at home in his hands. He was, after all, the master craftsman. He was the one who knew the inner workings of this instrument more intimately than anyone else. Slowly, the trumpet began to take proper shape. When all the individual parts were working to his satisfaction, the craftsman carefully put the instrument back together again. Then he buffed it to make it shine. After three days, he was ready for the man to pick it up. And when the old man opened the case, he couldn't believe his eyes. It looked like a brand new instrument. A weight began to lift from his heart. The last song of this trumpet did not have to be taps. The tragedy of his son's passing had turned into the joy of his granddaughter's wedding. On this day, a new song would play, a song of celebration. That afternoon, in a small chapel filled with family and friends, the old man raised the horn to his lips, pointed it skyward, and joyfully played the opening notes of the wedding march. Same instrument, same musician, different tune. The decisions we all face in our lives are like the notes on the page. Our instrument can be used to bemoan tragedy or sing praise and triumph, love and kindness or anger and hate, faith and obedience or doubt and pride. How we play our song is our choice, but a decision must be made. So what tune are you going to play? Have you ever tried to spice up a family dinner with the question, what song would you like to have played at your funeral? Or how about, what are you planning to wear in your casket? Sound like cheery topics? Hardly. Make a list of depressing subjects, and funeral preparations fall somewhere between IRS audits and long-term dental care. Most folks don't like to think about their funeral 
much less discuss it. After all, death signals the end of their time on earth, a time of grief and sadness for those they have left behind. This was certainly the case at first for the disciples of Jesus. When Christ was executed on the cross by the Roman soldiers, it must have seemed to them as if everything they had hoped for in the promised Messiah was coming to an end. Could there have been a greater tragedy for them than a dead Jesus? Three years earlier, they had turned their backs on their careers and cast their lot with this Nazarene carpenter. Earlier in the week, they had enjoyed a, a ticker tape parade as Jesus entered Jerusalem. But how quickly things had turned. The people who had called him king on Sunday called for his death the following Friday. Now their friend and their future were sealed behind a rock. The disciple John was the only one present at the cross. And from the cross, Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to this disciple whom he loved. He had seen Christ nailed to the cross. He had witnessed the puzzling midday darkness that fell. Like water douses a fire, the shadows had doused the ridicule. No more taunts, no more jokes, no more mockers. One by one, the onlookers had turned and moved away. The trio of dying men had groaned as they hung on the crosses. Hoarse, guttural, thirsty groans. They groaned with each rolling of the head and each pivot of the legs. But as the minutes became hours, the groans diminished. And then, John tells us, that just before Jesus died, he asked for something to drink. To find the last time moisture touched his lips, we need to rewind a dozen hours to the meal in the upper room. Since tasting that cup of wine on the night he was betrayed, Jesus had been beaten, spat upon, bruised, and cut. He had been a cross carrier and a sin bearer, and no liquid had salved his throat. He was thirsty. Jesus didn't have to suffer thirst, at least not to the level he did. Six hours earlier, before the nail was pounded, he had been offered drink. Mark said it was wine mixed with myrrh. Matthew described it as wine mixed with gall. Both myrrh and gall contain sedative properties that numb the senses. But Jesus refused them. 